This episode is brought to you by DistroKid. Hey everybody, today's guest is Tracy Ann Campbell, primary singer and songwriter for the Glasgow Scotland indie pop band, Camera Obscura. Together we break down the writing, recording, and inspiration behind the hit single, Lloyd, I'm Ready to Be Heartbroken, taken from their 2006 album, Let's Get Out of This Country. What a cool song and an amazing backstory, the likes of which have never come across Krista Makes a Podcast. The track is an answer song, a response to a song called Are You Ready to Be Heartbroken, released in 1984 by a band called Lloyd Cole and the Commotions. This combined with her own personal breakup around the same time, gave Tracy Ann all the inspiration she needed to pen the track. Producer Yari Hapalainen provided a killer production, and according to Tracy Ann, pushed herself and the band harder than ever before, with the results of this track being the fruit of those labors. So for all this and a whole lot more, stick around. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Tracy Ann, how's it going? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for sitting in and taking some time uh, to be on the show today. Became a big fan over the past few days of breaking down this song. Camera Obscura is, of course, from Glasgow, Scotland, and... I know that my band Less Than Jake has played festivals in the summer season with you. I've seen the band name before. And when this came across the desk, I said, man, I've, I've heard of them. And diving into this song, it's just so interesting. The, the, at least the story that I found online. And I can't wait to, to hear about uh, Lloyd. I'm ready to be heartbroken and exactly what's going on. Got to tell you, I love Glasgow. I've uh, always had amazing shows in Scotland. Um, the Barrowlands, of course, the Cad House, the Garage. Mm-hmm. You've been to all the hot spots. Yeah, I've even got to play the arena. Is that the NEC it's called there? Wow, SECC. S- yeah, okay, that's what it the is. Scottish Exhibition Centre. There you go. So great memories of Glasgow. You all were formed in 1996 and have released six studio albums to date. Your first album, Biggest Bluest Hi-Fi, was released in 2001. Your second record, Underachievers, Please Try Harder, (laughs) I love that, was released in 2003. And that's when you did your first tour of the United States. Uh, Your third album, Let's Get Out of This Country, is the album that Lloyd, I'm Ready to Be Heartbroken, Uh, The track is on that record. It was the first single released in May 2006, and the album was released uh, on June 6th, 2006, a little bit after that. Produced by, am I saying this right, uh, Yari Hapalainen? Yeah, that's it. Okay, okay. That's the guy. (laughs) Not bad for a yank. Not Uh, bad. Very good, (laughs) actually. (laughs) <laughs> um, he's a well-accomplished Finnish Swedish musician. I looked up his track record. Yeah. Wow. Songwriter and producer. And, you know, reading online, it said that the song is considered an answer song to the Lloyd Cole and the Commotion song, Are You Ready to Be Heartbroken? And this band was formed in 1982 in Glasgow. Between the years of 84 and 89, the band scored four top 20 albums and five top 40 singles. And what is really interesting, Tracy Ann, about this song is it was recorded in 84, I believe, and it doesn't sound dated. I'm sure Lloyd Cole and the Commotions would be delighted to hear that. To their generation, not even the government, I'm going to stop you now. But are you ready to be heartbroken? Are you ready to be Pumped up full of vitamins 
Unaccountable yeah, it didn't sound like, oh, this is definitely from the 70s for, or, or an 80s timepiece. There's something, uh, and what I'm getting at is that when songs are real and they're coming from here and there's not a gimmick behind it and you're not trying to keep up with the times, oh, punk's popular or disco's popular or new wave, when you're doing it from here, there's something about that. And I quite enjoyed the song. I had never heard of the band. And then I got to thinking, you know, what a great idea to answer a song with one of your own. And I started thinking, and I even went down the Google rabbit hole of, of t- I typed that in, answer songs. And a bunch of stuff came up, but nothing really like this. I know that there's songs that reference other songs. You know, Chubby Checker, The Twist, he wrote Let's Twist Again. Uh, yeah, yeah. Leonard Skinner talked about Neil Young and their song, how they had an issue with him. But I don't really know about any other answer songs. So do you know any other answer songs besides your own? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, actually, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure lots of folk have been inspired by, you know, obviously people are inspired by other songs and other music, and therefore they answer in in some way. You know, usually musically, I don't know that they necessarily answer with the lyrics. Well, what was the inspiration? Now, were you a fan as a kid back in when this song was released, and it meant something to you, and and you thought of writing a song uh well when i was a kid so when that's when did you say that was released 1984 1982 i think it was 84 i was like 10 so i was not a fan when i was 10 what i was i was a fan much later on when i was in my sort of late teens early 20s i started exploring music and getting into a lot of um going to a lot of like indie discos and you know and it would be certain groups that would get played every weekend and young people would get up and dance to and one of those bands was Lloyd Cohen Promotions. Um, I, I knew of them because they did have hits in the 80s, but I was too busy sort of dancing to Madonna and Lamb or, you know, something <laughs> like that. Um, I think they were probably a bit, a bit intellectual or wordy for 10-year-old me. But when I was 12 or 13, there was this uh, TV programme called I think it was called Going Live and it was like every Saturday morning every kid would watch it and they'd have you know pop stars on it or various guests and it's just what you tuned into on a Saturday morning and they would take different school groups from up and down the country to be the kids on the telly program and I'm very bad with timeline and dates but I was 12 so it must have been 86 something like that 1986 Okay. My school was the school that were on the, the telly program and, and it took part um, at this festival that we had in Glasgow called the, Gar- the Glasgow Garden Festival. Um, and it was an outdoor festival celebrating, uh, trying, to, trying to bring Glasgow, you know, change our, our image. You know, the, 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 Glasgow's always had a bit of a bad image problem, you know, dangerous city, lots of night crime. It was like that in the 60s, I think, the 50s and 60s some of the 70s, but certainly in the 80s and the 90s and going forward, we've, we've cleaned up our image. And anyway, the Glasgow uh, Garden Festival is part of that new image thing. Anyway, I, I digress, but Lloyd Cole and the Commotions were the pop band on the programme at the time. So I've actually got photographs in my house and my mum's got them with me, 12, 13-year-old me standing you know, with this band in the background. But I, t- I wasn't really into them. Right. So it's kind of funny now that I've got these photographs of me, you know, wearing a Benetton jumper um, at this school <laughs> thing. And um, Lloyd Cole and the commotions are sort of standing behind me, like, oh, and I'm cool. Um, and I'm standing there like an awkward teenager. That's um, awesome. <laughs> it is quite funny, actually. But yeah, so I got into I got into the Lloyd Cole and the commotions much later on. I think um, when I started songwriting, uh, well, I was a big fan of Lloyd Cohen Commotions and we danced to songs like that in the disco, we can look at it, look at it. Are they aware that you answered their song? Yeah, I've met I've met Lloyd Cole, um, <laughs> actually. Cool. And um, I remember, it must have been actually in 2006 when we went to the States to tour. And we toured the States a lot. We've done a few a few tours before then, but when Let's Get Out of This Country came out, we we sort of made a bit of a, 
maybe the biggest impact that we've made and we're doing the biggest, you know, US tour dates were a bit extended and, you know, the gigs were a bit better and bigger and all that. And we got this message from uh, Loyko's wife, Beth Cole, asking if her and the kids could come and see us in, um, I believe it was Ann Arbor. <laughs> Ann Arbor, Michigan. Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm very fond of that place. And uh, I remember the kids were too young to get in. Oh. But I met I met her. I met her. And then, strangely enough, I'm just back from a North American tour. And in Washington at the 930 Club, I came out of the bathroom and it was a young, handsome man in the dressing room. And he introduced himself as William Cole. So Lloyd's son had come to the gig. I think he was friends with my tour manager, but I was on my way out and I didn't really get a chance to talk to him much. And I thought he was going to be there when I came back and I would have had a chat with him, but I didn't, I didn't, he was gone. But I have met, I have met Lloyd. I, I met him, he played a show here in Glasgow at the Orin War, which uh, probably a bit of a smile on you for your band. But yeah, I met him. And it was, I think we did a, we did another thing where we did, we, we took part in a sort of interview thing in, in a magazine. I think it might have been under the radar magazine. I'm not, I can't remember. Well, it's it's easy to follow your timeline because we're about the same age. So this okay. is perfect. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, yeah, when yeah. you're talking about Dance Around a Whammy Boy, yeah, George, yeah. I get it. Yeah, I fully yeah. get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to ask, what are, I'm hearing so many things in this particular track, influences. Can you give me a couple of, of you know, your what you feel your influences are uh, for your sound in Camera Obscura? Well, for, for, for the sound in that record, um, I would say the song um, Abraham, Martin and John by Dion is the biggest influence. I love Dion. If I had to, if I had to choose my favourite male vocals, which I don't really like doing that sort of thing, but if I had to choose, it would be Dion. Anybody here seen my old friend John? Can you tell me where he's gone? He freed a lot of people, but it seemed the good they die young. I just looked around and he's gone. I don't know if you know that song, Abraham Martin and John. I do not. No, I'm going to have to check that out. I shouldn't really probably admit the blatant, I don't want to call it a rip-off. Let's just say that I was inspired. Yeah, of course, um, inspired. The, the structure of the song is really inspiring to me, the way it starts with this um, organ, and then it you know, it sort of dances along, and then singing, and then it sort of breaks down again in the middle. And I just, I was obsessed with that song, still obsessed with it. I, I listened to it a lot, and I, I get a lot out of that vocal and that, that sound and that lyric. So musically, musically, that's what it was kind of inspired by. Let's say inspired. You know, I'm hearing so much stuff in this. And I had mentioned a little bit ago that uh, the Lloyd Cole song sounds timeless and honest to me. And that's what your song sounds like. You know, it sounds timeless but at the same time and and i mean this with the utmost respect i'm hearing a little bit of uh, abba i'm hearing what i consider stuff that i would hear on 70s am radio in the states you know those synths either i don't know if those are are, are real strings or if they're synth strings but that and they're real strings they're real strings okay yeah okay. we we re- and weirdly or interestingly that you say that about abba we recorded that record in Sweden. Um, we didn't make that record in the ABBA studio. It was our next album, My Modern Career, that we made in the ABBA studio, oh, cool. Atlantis ABBA's old studio, with their de- their new desk and you know their piano um, that they used. And but Let's Get Out of This Country was not recorded at Atlantis, but it was recorded in a Swedish studio, and um, we recorded the strings and. I can't remember the exact music house studio it was, but it was one of the big guys like Sony or something like that. I'm not I'm not sure, I'd be lying, I can't remember, but it was recorded in Sweden with a Swedish producer and a Swedish string arranger. So maybe Okay. And a Swedish string arranger was Bjorn Yitling from Peter Bjorn and John. 
when I put the song and I've listened to it now, uh, my listeners know I, I listened to these songs 30, 40 times. I comb through them and it just made me happy from the first time I put it on. There's just something yeah. sparkling and honest about this. You mentioned uh, the album My Maudlin Career 2009. You guys released Desire Lines in 2013 and your newest album, Look to the East, Look to the West, was just released in May of this year, 2024. Congratulations for uh, still doing this. Still getting on with it. Still getting <laughs> still on getting with it. Still getting on it. I'm like a dog with a bone and I just won't let it go. <laughs> oh. I I can fully, fully relate. I want to jump into the track now. Lloyd, I'm ready to be heartbroken is three minutes and 49 seconds. The intro, there's a two-note pickup of a church organ, followed by six bars of just that organ. On bar seven, the whole band comes in, drums, bass, and a clean rhythm guitar slightly panned off right. That church organ and the strings, which there's points in this song where it sounds like real strings, and then it sounds like synth strings with all the other layers you have going on. So that's why I had asked you, are, are those real strings? Because it's it's so cool how there's points where I'm picking through it going, man, is that a keyboard or are those strings there? Well, we certainly use real strings in that, in that album and in that, in that song, but I do also know that we, we probably use the string machine at parts on that album, but I couldn't, I couldn't tell you specifically if there was any string machine on that song, like I said, my memory's not great about things like that, but, but those that that's a real string arrangement, you know, um, on, on that. But there might be a string machine also somewhere. Well, there's also a lead guitar, pan slight left, and that lead waits two bars before coming in, kind of mimicking the two-note pickup at the top of the song. And then the guitar solo uh, lead goes for eight bars, and it doesn't feel weird because of that. It's a 10-bar section, but the first two are without the lead. It comes in on the third bar, so... And there's six six choruses in the song as well. Yeah. (laughs) It's one, then two, then three. I know, it's really cool. And then we get in to verse one. said i'll protect you like you are the crown jewels yeah said he's feeling sorrier for me the more i behave badly i can bet well i think i was in the middle of a breakup or had yeah i was getting over a a big breakup and i was kind of uh reflecting on the relationship a little a little bit but i was also filling it in with you know my own sort of style of lyric writing which maybe I have been influenced by Lloyd Cole you know his lyrics are they make you laugh but they'll Mm -hmm. also sort of break your heart and he likes to he likes to write and draw one of the things I like about Lloyd Cole's writing is that he really paints a picture you know he really whether it's coming from him or not he really gives you a sense of what books he's written, what streets he's walked down, what um, films he's watched. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, he, he, he'll quite often talk about still cultural things. Um, and I suppose I I adopted that a little bit okay. um, quite early on, that, that, that thing about throwing little drops of myself into the song. You know, you can have a concept like, well, I'm going, I need to write this song because I'm heartbroken and I can see it coming. It was about that. It was about seeing a relationship coming to an end and not quite knowing how to put the brakes on that Mm -hmm. and almost being tempted, you know, a carrot and a stagger and a stick with the, with the end coming. You know, it was quite twisted actually, I think, in a, in a, in a, in a way that I've never thought about. And, 
yeah, so it's, it's a reflection on on a on a a healthy relationship, but it's all going to go, you know, tits up if I can say that. <laughs> you and, can. Uh, <laughs> we're not on the BBC, yeah. and uh, I and I can see it coming. Hey, everybody, don't go anywhere. We got lots more coming up with Tracy Ann Campbell after a few words from our sponsors. Looking to elevate your music career? DistroKid is a digital music distribution service that enables musicians to distribute their music to online stores and streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube Music, Amazon, Tidal, and many more. DistroKid collects earnings and payments, sending them to you, the artist. With DistroKid, artists unlock a world of possibilities. From easily paying collaborators with splits to securing your music with DistroLock, DistroKid covers all bases. Plus, you can promote your releases with HyperFollow and create eye-catching visuals with the Spotify Canvas Generator, all for free. But that's not all. Introducing the DistroKid app, now available on iOS and Android. Artists can manage their releases, view streaming stats, and withdraw earnings, all from the palm of their hand. And for those looking to perfect their sound, check out Mixia. With its simple interface and customizable mastering options, artists can make their music sound polished and professional within minutes. And don't forget about Instant Share, DistroKid's newest feature. Share large files securely with collaborators, producers, and more, ensuring your music streams at the highest quality. Ready to take your music to the next level? Download the DistroKid app and explore their suite of tools today. Plus, listeners can enjoy 30% off their first year by visiting distrokid.com slash VIP slash Demakes. That's distrokid.com slash VIP slash Demakes. Hey friends, have you been loving Chris Demakes a podcast? Well, spread the love by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Don't hesitate to share what you enjoy about the show in an actual written review on Apple Podcasts. Not only does it help more people discover us, but we often read reviews in the rap segment of the show. It's a quick, cost-free way to support us and takes just a minute of your time. Your reviews mean the world to us and help us keep the podcast thriving. Thank you for being a listener and thank you for being a friend. And now, back to the show. Do you feel like, and my listeners know this, I had so many premonitions that came true later when I got out in, into music. I met my idols. I, I had situations that are, that are baffling to me uh, the older I get. Yeah. Do you feel like, you know, the story you presented a little bit ago about seeing uh, them all those years back when you were a kid with your mom, Yeah. do you feel like that all kind of came to a head? And, and was this song specifically written for this record, Let's Get Out of the Country? Uh, yeah, it was written for that. Re- it was written for that record. You know, uh, a lot of the songs are probably around this, about the the same sort of breakup. That just really it was my first big big breakup, and I just couldn't get, get over it. You know, I couldn't really, I couldn't really process it very well. I wasn't very mature. I wasn't mature enough to process it, and I had to process it through songwriting. And uh, I just remembered another thing actually about about Lloyd Cole. I'd written this song and it, and it wasn't recorded yet for the the album wasn't recorded, and my ex boyfriend offered me tickets weirdly to go and see Lloyd Cole and the Commotion through Forum. I've just remembered that, and I remember at the time saying, "I've written a song about him. That's really weird." It was sort of, "Oh, this is spooky." I've just remembered that. I've got a bad memory, but I just remember that. But yes, your point about you know. Growing up and becoming a musician or a songwriter and then being faced with things or people like folk who were you were influenced by or who meant a lot to you, sometimes I am a bit like, this is weird, you know. I met um, Chris Montez one time. He came to one of our shows. He came to the Henry Fonda in LA. And that was weird. And then I had this Twitter conversation with Belinda Carlyle who I was practically obsessed with when I was a teenager. <laughs> You know, <laughs> my, my, my teenage self mind was completely blown yeah. that this woman could even know who I was, never mind, you know, have an interaction with me for two minutes. So, yeah, stuff like that's kind of awesome. That's the 
magic of the modern world. It's also a horrible thing at times, but because I'm never, I've, I've never been the kind of person. I'm not very. Um, I'm a bit shy, so I'm not the sort of person that ends up in, you know, green rooms or backstage so that I can make folk. <laughs> I, I hate it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, how do you think I feel here? You know, I I was at the Kerrang Awards years ago. My band got a wow. got a got an award and. Yeah. I met Brian May from Queen that night. You Whoa. Know? I met Tony Iommi yeah. from Black Sabbath. I met Rob Halford from Judas Priest, the guys in Slayer, <laughs> Meatloaf. All these people that, that, you know, I grew up listening to and adoring. And uh, it's just an incredible feeling. Verse one, I love the vocal treatment that's going on here. The delay and what's happening with the voice sounds great. Verse one continues with the instrumentation from the top, but... We are joined by what sounds like a slightly detuned electric piano here in the verse. Oh, yeah. It might be. I'm not sure. I'm trying to think. I, 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 need, I haven't listened to the song for a long time. Of course, I know the song because we play it live, but <laughs> I, I've not listened to it. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't said this in a while, but I used to say to guests when they when they say that, I'd say, "What? You don't drive down the road and listen to your own music?" It's like, no. Um, I mean, occasionally I will. But yeah, I, I would say I'm guilty of that, but I haven't listened to this for a while. Gotcha. Well, uh, chorus one comes right off of verse one. Lloyd, I'm ready to be heartbroken because I can't see further than my own nose at this moment. Yeah, well, that's a bit that's a bit me sort of saying I can't see the wood for the trees, which is which I'm I'm still guilty of. I, I'm good at reflection, but sometimes in the minute I'm not so aware. Is that a Scottish term? Can't uh, further than my own nose? Is I've, that is it? Yeah, I've never. All right, I can't see. You can't see. It's a saying. I've hate people say it. Maybe it is a Scottish saying or a British saying. I don't know. You can't see farther than your own nose. I've never heard it before, but I absolutely love what it says. It's really cool. We got harmonies on both of those lines, and the harmonies are haunting. They're not just your, yeah. your usual third harmonies. There's some really, really cool stuff going there. Yeah. The woman who did the harmonies was a, a, a Swedish musician called um, Brita Persson. Uh, Beta person. We, we we used to nickname her British person, um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> because we're stupid and we just make up stuff like that. So uh, Brita person, not British person, um, did the did the, the harmonies, and she 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 still makes music in Sweden, and she is an amazing singer. And she just did. We we were. I remember at the time we were quite skeptical of it because we were very much a band and a gang you know we had that band mentality and that gang mentality and it's right we just make records and it's just us uh-huh. but when we worked when we worked with Yari he was sort of he was just like why do you have all these rules you know <laughs> I know well we we do that as so musicians we're, we're very protective of our own it's our art exactly yeah exactly. I get that so, I get that but he he really took us out of our comfort zone because all of a sudden he was going right well we're going to this guy's going to write string arrangements and this woman's going to come and do some backing vocals and this accord accordion is just coming in and we're like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know. I did notice when I, I looked at some live videos that your guitarist, Kenny McKeeve, he does the, yeah. the backing vocals during that part. Uh, he does the thing on the chorus, yeah. I think he's, I don't know if he's on the record singing in the chorus. I didn't hear it. He might be. Again, I don't know. I think the thing is, you get so caught up in what you do live that that's just what you do live. I know. You know? But these these days, he, he does sing on the choruses, actually. It's a three-part harmony, so there must just be like a three-part harmony or three, you know, two um, harmonies, and he sings one of them, and uh, these days, Donna and the Chacha sings the other. Well, there's some uh, nice single note uh, piano happening here in the chorus. There's also tambourine on every snare hit, and that tambourine on the snare hits continues through the four bar reintro. Uh, the strings are nice and loud here in the mix, and this part, this part is so bouncy and fun. That piano yeah. uh, playing that staccato figure again, it just it's like that '70s AM radio. It's just it's happy. It doesn't. Uh, it's yeah, happy. It's 
it's driving, but at the same time, the lyric, like you said, it's <laughs> it's kind of morose, you know, this happy music. Yeah. with it, it, I like the dichotomy between that. Yeah, it is kind of morose, I think. And I think that without it trying to, that seems to be my thing. Um, you know, the songs tend to start with me in a guitar sounding also morose as the lyrics can be. And then I guess we turn it into pop music. I remember that song particularly is when, you know, we used to have our little like Nokia phones or something, you know, yeah. we'd have a little dictaphone. And I remember I was very obsessed with the songs that we were creating then. And I had melodies coming out of my ears, you know, just like everywhere. I was just thinking and obsessed all the time. And I'd wake up in the night with melodies and try and sing them on the phone. And I remember waking up one night with the, you know, the trumpet part da, 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 in my head, going, oh, how am I going to get this down? You know, singing it into the into the phone and going to the rehearsal space. Right, I've got this bit. You know, it was a song that was sort of probably written in a lot of excitement. You know, I think you can hear that. There's a there's a there's a naivety to it, but there's also a confidence, and I think that that's what Yari brought out in us. And Yari is a great arranger. I mean, I I don't often take credit for having um, great arrangements, but I I do remember I was very specific about being obsessed with that Dion song and that, and Yari went with it. You know, he's always um, interested to know why you're writing a song and what it's about and are you influenced by anybody and why and you know he's interested in all that well that's that's a great producer because they're getting in the songwriter's head and sometimes they're able so. sometimes they're able to pull stuff out of us that maybe maybe we're not aware of maybe we are aware of and maybe we're afraid to bring that to the forefront he's like that and i remember also making that first record he was always making everything higher like i don't know what i don't know what key i wrote that song in but um i think the first chord is like E, it's maybe an E, which is kind of weird. But when I sing, it's is it B? I think I start singing in B. Well, I was anyway, ca- I was capoing it on the second fret. That's what I was playing. As I, found I play it. I play it open, and okay. I think it's sort of, anyway. But a lot of the songs in that record, he 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 would push it as far as I could go, and he'd be like, "So does that feel uncomfortable?" And I say, "Yeah, it does a bit." And you go, "Okay, good," <laughs> you know. <laughs> And he just, he'd really like to hear you struggling a little bit. It, it adds urgency to a vocal. I think it did something. And I do struggle these days with some of the, the jumps from the verse mm-hmm. to the chorus in some of those songs. That's awesome. Well, verse two. Jealousy is more than a word. Now I understand. You can't stay a girl while holding a boy's hand. Yeah, for the first time in my life, I'm feeling uh, pangs of um, ugly feelings, and I'm able to admit them. Ugly feelings about love and about people that you have loved. And I guess the you can't stay, stay a girl while holding a boy's hand is a bit telling myself, you know, you need to you need to grow up a bit here. The string uh, arrangement here is playing in a higher register. It really cuts through the mix. And again, sometimes that can distract from a vocal or what's going on. That Those strings here are like almost matching your vocal in volume, but it works perfectly. Yeah. Do you remember having that yeah. conversation when you were mixing it? Did you think it was too loud? And I think there were a lot of conversations during the mixing because I think the records that we had made before, they weren't really produced by anybody and they were just, you know, us in a room and probably mainly me making lots of decisions about stuff. I had no idea what I was um, making decisions about it. it was just all about whether I liked it or I didn't so um, when we made that record he was very much in charge and you know and he was very much had opinions about everything and he'd made loads of records he knew what he was doing he knew what he was doing and he knew that he wanted to push things and make things extreme he wasn't he was never um, happy with the sort of middle of the road vibe and he'd say that to us, you know, okay, if you want to be boring, you know, 
do it, but what's the point? Like, if you're going to do a slow song, do a slow song. If you're going to do a fast song, do a fast song. He's like, your records are okay, but they're kind of boring, and we're not making a boring record. And we're like, all right, then. <laughs> you know what he was doing there? He was trying to elicit a response, and if the response was anger, then hey, that's, you know, he's trying to fire yeah. you up, and sometimes the best producers do that. I've had producers tell me something in the vocal booth that just doesn't sit well with me, and it just, yeah. like, fires you up, and then you'll get a vocal take out of it, and uh, that's that's the genius and the psychology behind a great producer. You said it a second ago how this song builds chorus two. We get a double chorus here. <laughs> ready to be heartbroken because I can't see further than my own nose at this moment. And it repeats. And then again, you say at this moment again, before we go into a four bar intro, there's tambourine on all the snare hits here. And the high harmony vocal here seems louder in the mix with like a, maybe a different pre delay. Uh, it's definitely not a copy and paste of the first chorus. And no, she, I don't think she did the same thing twice. It's awesome. And I figured it was you singing that. Yeah, well, no, I didn't do any harmonies on those records. Um, I just sung my song the way I sung it. And I think quite often I won't sing the same thing again. I would say I'm not a very technical singer, you know, so sometimes I've never, I'm not I'm not so good at, you know, matching mm -hmm. what somebody else does. I'm, I, I'm a bit better at that now. I'm, I've learned to do that a little bit, but I certainly didn't know how to do it then and, I think maybe I didn't always do the same thing, so Brita played off of me, and she certainly never did the same thing twice. Well, yeah, you, the melody changes a little bit on uh, Broken, the back half of, of Chorus 2 on Heartbroken uh, changes, and I, I noticed that, and I love that. I always think that that, again, it's another uh, thing that makes a song feel real. In the days now of everything's on computers and copying and pasting, yeah, you, you know, it might be good for electro dance music or something that's repetitive, but in this case, I think it's best to do it this way. After Chorus 2, we get that four-bar reentry. Those high strings are coming to a crescendo here before the next part. The tambourine is going uh, the whole time, and then it goes to 16th notes right at that crescendo into a full band stop. And then we get the organ interlude. It's the same as the top of the song. You get those two pickup notes and the organ for six bars before the band comes in for the bridge. <laughs> I had to do all the counts. I'm saying, wait a second, this is the same as the top. And a lot of times you want to make it different. Let's make it shorter or make it longer, but it's perfect here. How did you settle on uh, having it be the same? I think if I'm not wrong, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know if this is exactly, but I, I can only imagine it's because I wanted to do what Dion did with Abraham, Martin and John. And I'm assuming that that's the same. I'd need to go and listen to it to make sure. I should have done the homework before this. But if it would have been very, it would have been for a very specific reason. It would either have been that I dug my heels in and said, I want it exactly the same as his record, you know, in terms of the length of the bars. 
or Yari would have said, it's got to be like this. You know. I love that you took inspiration from two different artists. Here it was an answer to the Lloyd Cole song, but yet you have inspiration in other ways too with Yon. That's just, it, it's cool. What did Yari think about that? You were coming from two different places. I think Yari loves it when you're insp- genuinely inspired and you've got ideas. He doesn't want um, people just sitting on the couch with nothing to say. Yeah. And it's easy to fall into that trap. Sure. You know, be too scared to speak up. Um, I guess when I get excited about something, I've got a very clear idea about what I want, and then I'm not scared, but he likes opinions, and he has his own opinions as well. He's never super dismissive of you, but he will argue his point if he thinks he's doing the right thing. Good for him. That's that. That's awesome. Well, the bridge, it's the same as the top of the song. The band is in for two bars before the guitar solo happens. The guitar solo is louder here in the mix. Uh, there's single tambourine hits on bars three, five, seven, and nine. Tons of reverb on those single hits on the tambourine. Then bar 11 through bar 26. It's single tambourine hits with the snare drum. Uh, the strings are super loud and work perfectly against the solo. Again, the strings are almost as loud as the solo here, kind of like the chorus with your vocal. And again, there's just something, uh, I don't know, that that those strings just make me feel good. Well, I think the thing is, if you're going to use strings, you should really use them for a purpose. And I think when we made that record, I was listening a lot to a lot of um, songs with string arrangements, like, you know, like people like Lee Hazelwood and maybe like, you know... um, Petula Clark's Pie Years, you know, lots of songs with, um, yeah, beautiful string arrangements and, 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 and the producers not being shy about them. You know, I love very much the whole wall of sound thing. And I don't like it when a band puts strings on a song and you're not really sure why they're there. <laughs> or they're buried so much in the mix. And I'll tell you what yeah. happens. The producer like, well, has this idea and someone in the band goes, but we don't have we don't have a synth or we don't have, we don't have a string player. Yeah. You know, how, how are we going to yeah. fill this part out? And to the producer's point, we're making yeah. a record live is different. Sure. I think when we, when we wanted strings, it was because we could hear the melodies and we knew that that's what we wanted them to, be, yeah. you know, be playing. It'd be sounding like. It's so catchy. Well, right out of the bridge, we go into verse three. I got a life for compilation. I've got my life of complication here to sort out. I'll take myself to an East Coast city and walk about. I used to have this job back then. Uh, I, I used to distribute posters for this art company. And part of my job, I was sort of like a manager of the people who put the posters up, but I used to do some of it myself. And some of my job was to drive to other cities in the country and I'd get to drive to, you know, Dundee, uh, which is in the, I'm in the, we're on the West Coast, but Dundee's on the East Coast. And I'd go to Dundee, Brecon, Forther and our both. Um, every other week and it was a beautiful drive and through the Perth countryside and gorgeous you know views and I just get very lost in music Um, I get lost in listening to music but I get very lost in creating songs in my head so I wrote, I wrote a lot of these lyrics in my head whilst driving my little escort van yeah. um, and walking around the streets of Dundee putting posters up and um, I literally feel like most of the songs on Let's Get Out of This Country were written on the streets of Dundee, our bro, wow. Breaking Um Not, it's some in, in the city here, but but that job gave me the headspace to to do that, actually. And it was quite um, fundamental in, in, the, in the writing of those songs, actually, getting to do that. Isn't that weird? I'll, I'll be washing the car and, and lyrics will come in my head and I'll have to stop. Yeah. You know, when you're doing, you know, kind yeah. of uh, uh, meaningless yeah. jobs, you know, just sticking up another poster and not thinking about it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, you're always, your, your brain is just works that way, I guess. And I suppose the more you do that kind of thing, the more open you are to listening to that little voice in your head that's telling you that they want to write down a lyric. 
Yeah. You know? Well, you want to talk about bouncy. This song just keeps building. All the instrumentation here in uh, verse three, it gets busier and a bit louder in the mix. I wrote it's the most playful verse of the three. It's just like the whole <laughs> yeah. party's here. You know, the the whole song was, was rocking along, but uh, it really comes to a head here in verse three. And then chorus three is now three times one on chorus one two on chorus two and i'm assuming this was uh this was planned because uh, of the dn song i think that no i actually think the choruses were probably uh, doing i i probably vaguely remember feeling this is excessive are you sure about this he was just going yep we're gonna do it one two and three you know it's such a short song and you can't really believe it's a short song because if you write the structure down the structure just seems well this must be so long you know but it's not. It's under four minutes. It's, and he, he's very into that, you know, snappy. Mm -hmm. If this is a pop song, let's make it a pop song that gets played in the radio. Well, if you just take the verses in the chorus and the bridge of this song and nothing else, it is a short song. I mean, you got the yeah, yeah. the whole organ intro, the uh, the organ interlude reintro, uh, and then let's not forget the bridge guitar solo is twenty six bars. So that's a that's a great point. <laughs> Same lyric. Hey, Lloyd, I'm ready to be heartbroken because I can't see further than my own nose at this moment. That happens three times. And on the last line, we get at this moment again, like chorus two. Great backing vocals swirling uh, around here, way more than chorus two. On the last two lines, a great higher vocal comes in here at the very end. It's like, it's wow. Bit, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very, <laughs> very... It's a bit jazz hands at the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very triumphant. Uh, also on the last two lines, uh, the high strings are really loud and powerful here. They just really come up to really end this song strongly. Uh, and at the lyric, at this moment... There's like a four bar musical intro with the high note on moment held out and the band abruptly stops and Lloyd, I'm ready to be heartbroken comes to an end. Indeed. Well, all good things do. <laughs> <laughs> so the song was the lead off track on the album. It was the first single. Yeah. Uh, was it kind of glaringly obvious that this was the track that you wanted to, uh, to, to push first? I think so. And I kind of vaguely remember we decided that probably before we even recorded the song. This is the single. Let's throw the kitchen sink at it. <laughs> you know, sort of, let's, let's all, it's all bells and whistles, isn't it, really, that song? By the end, your ears are kind of ringing because yeah. you feel like you've been through the mill. Um, yeah, I think it was decided by Yanni. This is the single. Awesome. This well, thank you again for, for sitting in with us today. Congratulations on, on continuing with your career and the new record, Look to the East, Look to the West, which is out now. And do I have anything coming up? Uh, well, we just finished our North American tour um, and we're going to play a gig with Bell and Sebastian at SWG3 here in Glasgow. I think that's on the 29th of August. It's a little festival. And we are going to play a show in Cardiff. We're going to play End of the Road Festival. I think that's in August. And we're doing a European tour in September, October. And then I think that at the minute we'll, we'll, just, we'll just see what happens. We'll see what we can logistically manage. Well, I'm going to find you at a European festival and come knock on your door and steal all your crisps. Wonderful. <laughs> It'll be great to meet you. You as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.
Hey everybody, the song you're hearing right now is Liberty Print from the new Camera Obscura album, Look to the East, Look to the West. I hope you all enjoyed this episode with Tracy Ann, but don't go anywhere. We have lots more Chris to Makes a Podcast coming right up after a few words from our sponsors. Hello out there! Hi, I'm Hal Schwartz. And I'm Flynn McClain. We want to tell you about our podcast, None But the Brave, which is dedicated to taking a deep dive into the work of Bruce Springsteen. We're currently in our fifth season. Our latest episodes focus heavily on Bruce's 2024 tour and have featured such guests as Anthony Castrovince from MLB Network and Barstool's Kirk Minahan. We're also covering the 40th anniversary of Bruce's biggest record, Born in the USA. And as part of that, coming up this week, Uproxx cultural critic Stephen Hyden returns to the show for a fascinating hour-long conversation about his new book. There was nothing you could do. Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA and the End of the Heartland. To listen, you can go to our website, mbtbpodcast.com, or subscribe on your preferred podcasting platform. We hope to see you further on up the road. Thank you so much. We'll be seeing you. Hey there, Krista Makes a Podcast listeners. Ready to take your podcast experience to the next level? By signing up for the supporting cast at KristaMakes.com. You not only ensure the continued production of our show, but also unlock exclusive perks. Subscribers receive a weekly bonus episode of our other podcast, The After Party, co-hosted by Chris Fafalius and myself. Many fans rave that The After Party is just as enjoyable as the main show. And with close to 200 music-centric episodes in the archive, there's a treasure trove of entertainment awaiting you. Thank you for tuning in and for your support in keeping the podcast going strong. Join us at KristaMakes.com and let's keep the fun conversations going. As we near the end of the show, here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Krista Makes a Podcast, email your best song via MP3 only and a short bio to band you might not know at gmail.com. This week's featured artist is Doubtful, an indie solo project gone wild from Chicago, Illinois, featuring summery pop rock songs with loads of harmonies. Doubtful just released a new EP, We All Get What We Deserve, and that's streaming everywhere. Here's a snippet of their song, Retrace. Nobody's words Gotta sleep is yours You always know But I don't want to be told And I can't really trace How we got this way Everything you say Keeps me up for days The Rap with Chris and Chris Chris, you know I was very excited about this episode. I really wanted to make this one happen. I've been a fan of this band and especially this song for a long time. You guys touched on a little bit of what I love so much about this song. It's that the subject matter and the lyrics of this song are, for the most part, pretty sad. But the music could not be happier. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will uh, kind of toot my band's horn on that one. We made, we've made a career out of that. These bouncy, happy ska songs with, with dark lyrics. I, I've always loved that. I've always uh, loved how that makes you feel. Here you are. And the greatest thing is sometimes you'll see bands at festivals with this happy song. And there's, you know, 50,000 people jumping up and down singing the most sad lyric ever. And you're like, what is going on? Yeah, there's something about singing along to lyrics about how you might feel you might feel down yet the music being uplifting at the same time and you use the word dichotomy i don't know if that's the right word to describe but really it probably is that's what's going on it's what i love about this song chris tracy ann's like our third or fourth scottish guest we've had on the show and you and i were having a laugh (laughs) between the end of the recording and starting to record this rap about how it seems to be this (laughs) this thread among the Scottish guests where when it first starts, I feel like, oh no, are they hating this? Are they hating talking about their music? But then about maybe one third of the way through, they start smiling and opening up. Maybe it's 
that they're relaxing or something. Maybe it's something culturally about being Scottish. I don't know. Maybe it's just coincidence. But I saw that happen with Tracy Ann today. I saw her as it went on start to enjoy herself and relax and and be happy about getting into the song and uh i love this episode yeah i try to you know tell all the guests at the top hey you know before we start rolling i i did all the heavy lifting here just to try to enjoy yeah. yourself and uh you know the the, the the scots are very determined uh I'll, I'll use the word they're they're hard people and uh and then you get them drinking and they're your best friend in the world <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh you know and this is Slightly related to that, but I don't think this is particularly Scottish. She talked about as being like a younger band, having to get used to additional musicians coming into the studio Mm. and being okay with these other people playing on your album, you know, and you feel weird about it at first because you're like, "Well, well, wait a second, this, this isn't us, but you know, you have to kind of give into it and be like, no, we, we got to do what's best for the song. On this song, it's backing vocals, it's strings, it's everything, mm-hmm. all the bells and whistles that make this song what it is. Well, and she uh, even said that the, the other records, this was the first really produced record that they did. A lot of it was just what made her feel good and, and her ideas. And uh, it sounds like they took some uh, some risks with this. You know, producer Yari uh, Hopalainen, and he, it sounds like he challenged them, you know? Yeah. He kind of, you know, he, he kind of wanted to, for better or for worse, elicit a response. You know, what are you trying to say here? And um, again, that that's the psychology of, of a great producer. Yeah, I like how he said, well, if you just want it to be middle of the road and boring, that's fine. We can do that. <laughs> he w- but he wasn't happy with that. And I think, you know, sometimes I-, I really believe this. To make a great song, you got to make bold decisions and make things loud and make things pop out and make things memorable. The strings in this song are, are a big part of that. They are not subdued and in the background. They are really in your face. And it's such a huge element of this song. And it's a... It's a bold production choice, and it uh, is. Yeah, I think it paid off. I didn't use the term, but they're they're lead strings. That's what they. That's uh, sure. Kind, kind kind of what they're doing there. It was as, almost as loud as the guitar solo and the vocal uh, in the chorus. But uh, hadn't heard of this song. Uh, heard the band name many times. Probably played some festivals with them. But uh, I was really happy to to come across this one, and uh, she was super cool. Yeah, I agree. And it's our first ever, I believe response song to another song i know and Makes i want to do that i even asked her i said you know any other songs uh so if anybody listening if you want to uh hit the krista makes a podcast facebook group and let us know if there's yeah. other answer songs i gave some examples uh earlier you know like the twist he wrote let's twist again okay it's kind of about his first song or you know there's been people that talk smack eminem is talk smack and songs about other artists or other songs but rap songs yeah. rap songs do that a lot yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, and never exactly uh, the blueprint of, of what's uh, what's going on here. It's super cool. And what else is super cool is if you go over to KristaMakes.com, you can join our supporting cast, which helps Chris and I keep the lights on here. Chris, tell them all about it. That's right. Hey, every week you get a bonus episode of our other podcast called The After Party, plus the second you sign up to the supporting cast at KristaMakes.com, you get access to like, I think we have like, 200 episodes of the after party in the back catalog and almost all those episodes are evergreen we talk about music we talk about history lots of fun conversations and uh if you got any uh road trips coming up or if you got (laughs) if you got some downtime or if you're like me and you like to put on podcasts while you're making breakfast or cleaning the house or whatever man you have a treasure trove if you go sign up at kristamakes.com so uh, i think you'll like it and like chris said you help us keep the lights on here at chris to makes a podcast and that's right and if you don't make breakfast or clean the house this may give you uh i don't know might give you some motivation to do that that's right the after party on and uh get get the step in there uh (laughs) if you haven't already go over and give us a follow we have a uh Instagram page now, Krista Makes a Podcast. Chris puts up tons of great reels up there, uh, live stuff with uh, myself and the guests and all sorts of other little goodies. Want to thank this week's guest, Tracy Ann Campbell, for sitting in with us, and we'll catch you next week. One Hit Thunder is a podcast where we both celebrate and have a good laugh about bands and artists that had just one hit that we all know. Each week, we're joined by a guest from the world of music or comedy to learn more than you ever thought you would about some songs that you can't forget. 
and we decide if they brought the one-hit thunder or were nothing more than a one-hit blunder. Look, if you listen to the show, you're probably going to laugh, and I guarantee you're going to crush next time the bar has music trivia. Tag Team, Jane Child, Meredith Brooks, Looking Glass, Sean Mullins, Eiffel 65, EMF, Crash Test Dummies, Crazy Town, Chumbawamba. We have hundreds of episodes in our back catalog and a new episode each week. So pass the duchy, make sure you're connected, and subscribe to One Hit Thunder wherever you get your pods. Hey, this is Steve Choi, host of the Musicians Guild podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. Within the four walls of the Musicians Guild, we'll be discussing the habits, idiosyncrasies, experiences, and general psychology of my friends and peers all involved with music in various capacities. Listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com. Ever wonder what a punch from Elton John feels like? Or how you cope with having turned down the chance to be in Nirvana? Or what signal Keith Richards gives when he wants you to get the hell out of his hotel room? Fans of Too Much Effie Perspective don't have to wonder, because they've heard these exact stories and a jillion others on our podcast. I'm Alex Hoffman, former tour manager for Radiohead. And I'm musician and comedy writer Alan Keller. On the TMEP show, we get guests like Nancy Wilson from Heart, Jeremiah Freights from the Lumineers, and Modern Family's Julie Bowen to tell us things they may have only shared with their therapist, clergy, or a TMZ stringer. So join us on Too Much Effing Perspective. That's E-F-F-I-N-G Perspective. The only podcast you crank up to 11. Oh.